Nicholas Frankel, developer advocate at Hazelcast. Nicholas, hi, how are you? Hi, folks. Yeah, I'm fine. And you? I'm very well. I'm suffering a bit today because we're having all kinds of technical issues. But I can see you. I can hear you. So now all I'm going to do is hope that we can actually see your screen as well. And then I can celebrate. So far, so good. So let's try it. And one, two, three. Does it work? Yes, I guess so. I assume it's so. Um, if it doesn't work, if you don't see my screen, then please shout and, uh, well, I will try to do something about it. So thanks to be here for this talk about um, introduction to stream processing. I'm Nick. I'm a developer. I've been a team lead. I've been an architect. Well, I've been a lot of like technical, I've been holding a lot of technical roles. But since two years, I've become a developer advocate. I work for a company called Hazelcast. Hazelcast has two products. Our uh, first product was an in-memory data grid. And you can like imagine an in-memory data grid as distributed data structures. The most used one is the map. So distributed means that you can short it, you can replicate it among several nodes. And the second one is Hazelcast Jet, is actually does in-memory stream processing. And since I will present it a bit later, then I will stop to write it for now. In this talk, I will try uh, to list the following points to lead you to uh, its logical conclusion. So the first question is, why do we do streaming? Uh, you might have heard about streaming a lot uh, in the latest years and the why. Um, there are a couple of streaming approaches and we will see them. And then I will talk a bit about Hazel Jet because I need some implementation. Once we have defined streaming, I want to show you a demo. So I need data, so I will have a bit of a section about open data uh, in general and about a specification called the general transit fit specification. And finally, I will try to impress you uh, with a demo of the map of all the trains in Switzerland in close to real time. Um, so let's start no further and let's start. When I started working, as I mentioned, like <laughs> two decades ago, um, SQL base databases, they were everywhere. Um, you, you had no choice. Uh, you went to your DBA, you asked, hey, can I get a data store? Yeah, here is our like company approved SQL database. It could have been Oracle, it could have been SQL Server from Microsoft, could have been anything, but it was the way to store data. And even at the time, there were some issues with this way that um, SQL database uh, stored data. I there are at least two use cases uh, which don't fit that nice model. Uh, the first is analytics. Um, like imagine you are uh, the di director of a supermarket, you will probably ask your uh, analytic uh, data warehouse, hey, what are the sales in the previous hour? And then you decide, okay, let's have a discount on bananas because I, we have a lot of stocks and we didn't sell enough. And if you don't sell enough, then they will go to waste. So let's try to, to, to sell them. And uh, the other um, like kind of use case that doesn't fit nicely the SQL model is reporting. Uh, and reporting is when, for example, your bank uh, sends you like every month or every year your balance of your account. In both of those cases, we are only reading data. And that's the problem with SQL databases. Actually, the SQL databases, they are very interested in reads and in writes. And actually a lot of what they are doing is preventing you from uh, like writing bad data, or they're also preventing you, or at least the design of the database should prevent you from ri writing duplicate data. Because when a uh, disk is expensive, you don't want to uh, duplicate the data. And even if the disk is not that expensive, if you um, want to uh, like update data that is by, that has been duplicated by multiple records, you would need to go to every record to, to update it. And, and, and so you have those like uh, two, two edges of the swirl that on, on one side, uh, you have normalized data because you want your data to be nicely updated. 
And on the other end, you have like denormalized data because you, you want to read super fast. Um, and it balances between like having correct data versus having fast data. And that's, that's an issue with, with SQL because it, it's, it heavily skews toward having like correct data. And when you work with SQL, you know that uh, you, when you design your table, you should uh, pull at least the first three normal forms. Then when you do a query, then you need to join. And with the number of joins over several tables, then you like decrease the performance of your query. And then you have your constraints because you want that in this column, you only have integers. And in this column, you only have timestamps. And well, again, it's a lot about having like correct rights and reading, it's, it's another issue. And so even at that time, we recognize that because there were actors with, with different needs, actors who actually wrote transactional data and actors who needed analytical data. And so using the term database doesn't make a lot of sense. And for that reason, we invented ETL, extract from transform loads. Uh, you have one database, you extract the data, you transform it in the way you want, probably you denormalize it, you put everything into the same table and you load it again. And then you've got a, a, a database, a data store that you can read from and, and you don't care, you never write in it. So data can be denormalized, but at least you've got like very, very fast reads. And in order to do this ETL process, you needed something and we call it the batch model, the batch process. And if you have been working in IT for like more than a couple of months, then you probably came upon batches because batches, they are everywhere. They, I mean, you cannot go to a company with a decent history and, and not find any batch. They are everywhere. And batches, they have interesting properties. Um, the first property is in general, they are scheduled at regular intervals. Um, most of the batches, they are not run at the press of the button. Most batches, they run daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever. And they have another property, they, they take a certain amount of time to run. And well, you might imagine that at the beginning, if you have a batch that runs every hour, you probably made sure that the, the, the data that needs to be processed, it doesn't need more than, let's say, 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And, and so you've got a buffer and 20 minutes. But then over the, the, the time, then the, the data, the, it gets like bigger and bigger and bigger and, and you see that the buffer gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And so batches, they have a lot of problems and chief among them is, yeah, the execution time, it overlaps the next scheduled execution. Like hourly batches, they take more than 60 minutes to run and you don't want to be in that situation, but believe me, probably you will be or probably you already have been. Also, what about the size? Um, it can be uh, the size in memory because with batch model, you take everything into memory or when you dump it, you probably denormalize the data. So it takes a lot of storage and what about the, the problem of the disk? Uh, about the, 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 the overlapping with the next execution, uh, well, imagine it runs hourly and it takes 30 minutes, but what if it fails just at the end, then you need to rerun it. And again, we get back to the overlapping problem again. So there are a couple of solutions. Um, the easiest one is, yeah, if it's too big, uh, if it fails mid execution, let's chunk it. So instead of loading everything, we, we, made, we make chunks, like artificial chunks, and then we keep a cursor and we say, oh, this chunk has been processed, so let's, let's process the other chunk. Um, but then if, if we uh, design it like that, uh, what about new data that comes in? Might be in chunk, might be not, it, it's, it's an issue. But mainly the problem is about scaling. At some point you will have problems of scale and that's the big data movement to try to solve. Um, if you start having a lot of data to process, then you will need to scale and at least all SQL databases that I know, um, they, they cannot scale horizontally. They have 
one main node, one leader that handles the writes and best of case, you have followers just in case uh, like the, the primary node fails, then it can like delegate and the other one, the follower becomes the primary node. Then it, it, it will be tasked to, to, to write. But this, this is like the bottleneck of the, uh, of the whole stuff, of the whole architecture. And big data like try to say, okay, so let's forget everything about uh, SQL because it's, it's, it's too much a constraint and let's try to scale horizontally and let's design data stores that can, can scale horizontally. And then came Hadoop, MapReduce. Um, but there were also this like philosophy of a hey, transactional data. Mm, well, perhaps we don't need that anymore and perhaps we can do and in other ways, well, I'm not sure it was very, uh, it was very successful, like saying, hey, it's not the problem of the database anymore, it's a problem of the developer or the architect. I'm not sure it, it, it worked that much. But um, yeah, it, it's in the NoSQL world, it's, it's a lot about uh, schema on read. So you, you just dump the data and when you read it, then it's up to the reader to make sense of of the format it was in, instead of enforcing constraints and saying, hey, this data, when it comes in, it needs to be like this and this and this and this and this, uh, like with columns or, or even documents. And there is this funny stuff called an event. And um, well, we have been like using events since ages, like, um, we, we use events when we interact with a graphical user interface, like at the click of a button. Uh, so if you have been doing a graphical user interface development, you're probably aware of events. And so the idea is, okay, instead of like having batches, let's make everything an event. So it's not about clicking a button, but something happens, like uh, data comes in and it's an event and let's process it. And it has a couple of benefits. Um, the first thing is it's memory friendly. So instead of having like two gigs or three gigs or like, like petabytes of data to, to handle at one time, well, you can have like one little event. And even if you have many of them, at least every one uh, separately, it like nicely fits into a small memory space. For the same reason, they are uh, really uh, like easily processed. And a benefit that actually is a side effect, um, instead of like uh, uh, pooling the data every time, like at regular intervals, then the data becomes pushed to you. And then it becomes very, very close to real time. S this is a side effect, but I think that's the main benefit because now the, the your like, I wouldn't, like your, your targets of this derived data, like is actually nearly reflecting your source of truth. Of course, with all the transform and filters and whatever you, you, you made it, but it, it follows the trend and it can be uh, used as a derived data source of truth. However, we need to change our mindsets from like finite data sets, because when you uh, handle batch, you say, okay, I will take like data from the year before, from the hour before, and it's finite to something that is infinite, that can virtually never stops. Like if you have a, a stream processing engine, of course it can fail, but then you uh, like distribute it over the network, you set up that many nodes. And so even if individual nodes, they will fail, then the process will always run. And so you've got like an ever, like an ever streaming process and the data it can handle, it can be infinite, can never stop. I, I don't mention um, stealth food stream, but of course you probably need to have some degree of analytics and whoever says analytics probably means some uh, aggregation. Well, is just like the next step. So yes, you will like handle every, every uh, events like individually, but then you can also like aggregate them either on, on disk or like in memory uh, to make like uh, 
analytics out of them. And then you've got the windows, uh, they can be like sliding the windows or they can be tumbling windows. Well, this is like classical stuff in stateful streams. And actually streaming is just like ETL, but distributed um, with the same operations that you could do before, the same transform, just as like uh, filters or mapping or whatever. And you can read from like as many sources as you want and drop it into as many targets as you want. You can also combine streams together if you want, or you can enrich streams with uh, like references. In general, the events that try to be as small as possible, so they will only reference the ID of something, but then when you push it into um, your target, probably you will need the whole payloads. So you will probably need to reference the ID and get the reference for somewhere. Well, that's part of this streaming process and it works. And it opens a whole new world because of this real time, or I, I shouldn't say real time because it's actually uh, untrue because it, you need time to process it. it. You need time to go uh, through the network. So I will say um, close to real time or near real time. It opens a, a lot of doors like near real time dashboard or statistics, um, like probably machine learning is very hype right now. So you can also uh, analyze this stream of data through an ML model. And so your ML model can learn from real data in real time. And if you have been doing, if you have been in the enterprise for some years, uh, like 15 years ago, perhaps 10 or 15 years ago, I think there was this new thing called complex event processing. And it was the idea that in the enterprise, you would put an enterprise service bus and then that um, like the application, they wouldn't send messages to this enterprise service bus. And then you could uh, subscribe to those. It reminds me, it reminds you something. It's exactly the concept of streaming. And the idea was like some application, they would subscribe to multiple events. And because those events happen in that order, in this way, then they will like make, they would like infer some uh, additional sense to uh, those uh, like individual events. They would make something out. Um, and that was called complex event processing um, for, for no real reason. I, I mean, I don't know why, but it was never really successful. But streaming is actually uh, the realization of that right now. Now, we, when you have, you, when you have you, those events, uh, you probably need to store them somewhere. Um, and right now, Kafka is the king of event storage. They, they are the event data store company. Um, I mean, Confluent is, sorry. Uh, also, I just would like to mention that, uh, yeah, there are alternatives and among them is Prusa, which is also an Apache project. So Kafka is this distributed uh, data store, uh, meaning that it persists everything on disk, which can be a benefit or not, depending on your use case. And then you can have consumers that subscribe to topics and the good thing is that uh, with Kafka is that it's up to the consumer to keep the cursor to where it was uh, it read its data last, so that you can have like slow consumer and fast consumers like reading from the same topic, and it's not an issue, which is really really a benefit. As I mentioned, you you might want to store your data, your events. And sometimes it might not be that a great idea to like store the events, process them and store them again, and then process them and store them again. Perhaps what you would like to have is like to pro like to read them from a source, to process them, like make all the steps necessary, and then just dump the final result somewhere. And for that reason, uh, for some use cases, you might like in memory stream processing engines would be a better fit. And there are a lot of them. Um, of course, there is Flink, there is Azure Cross Jet. There can be uh, also on the cloud. So you have you would have uh, Amazon Kinesis or Google PopSub. I mean, every cloud provider uh, has its own stream processing engine. Also a word, there is a project called Apache Beam that tries to be an abstraction layer over several of the above. 
Um, so that the ID would be, hey, you only deal with this abstraction layer and you don't care about the real implementation. I think it's a nice ID. Of course, uh, since there is no uh, standard yet in the stream processing engine world, um, it's hard to be a completely um, safe abstraction. It's a bit leaky somewhere, but I think it's, it's a good ID anyway. So let me just like uh, have a few slides about Hazel Cars Jet because I need to go into to the details. Um, that's an Apache 2 open source license project. Can be used as a single draw if you are a Java developer. It's very easy to use. I will have a, 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 just a few words afterwards. And we are leveraging the IMDG to distribute um, and to uh, like form a cluster. And the good thing about Hazelcast Jet is that it has a unified API for both streaming and batching. So if you are more used to batches uh, and you want to go to the streaming world, you can uh, like leverage first the batch API and just with a single line, you can cross the charts and go to the uh, streaming world. And of course, we've got uh, like an enterprise offering, but everything that I will show you right now is completely open source and free. Uh, Hazelcast and all streaming engine actually have those two concepts of pipeline and jobs. They might call it uh, with different names, but the concepts behind is pretty similar. First, you write your pipeline and basically it can be declarative or at least it looks declarative but in general, it's code. And then you will uh, tell where you will be reading from, where you will be writing to, and all the steps, all the transform and filters and whatever that you want to do. And then there will be a client that sends this pipeline, this code to the stream processing engine. The stream processing engine like receives the pipeline and then because it knows about its topology, it knows how many uh, nodes that it has, it will distribute it all over the network. And of course, following some constraints, for example, hey, probably uh, the reading and the writing might not be parallel. So it will like enforce those constraints. And once it runs the pipeline, then it becomes a job instance. As I mentioned, if you are a Java developer, it's quite easy to start with Jets because it's just a jar that you uh, put on your class path and then you start it with jet.new jet instance. And when you do that, actually it starts, well, a jet instance and the jet node will start uh, multicasting over the network to find other nodes. And when they find each other, they form a cluster. There are a couple of limitations to this approach. And the first one is, well, you have the jet load and you have your application load and probably they are not the same. So it will be hard to fine tune your GVM regarding uh, the overall thing. And yeah, for that reason, might not be that good. For the, the other reason is um, at some point you will reach a limit and you will need to scale your application. You will need to, to, to put more nodes. And the problem is if you reach uh, the, the limit with jets, then you will, sc you will uh, scale your, your cluster uh, along the number of jet nodes, but your application is bound to it. So you'll scale your application also for no real reasons. So in general, this is good when you start or for uh, small companies, but then when you start getting serious about it, then you go to the other deployment model, which is client server. In that case, you have two different, <coughs> sorry, two different parts. You have your jet clusters on one side, and then you have your uh, client application. Sorry. And this, in this way, you can um, configure your uh, GVM according to your jet loads on the client server part and configure your GVM according to your application workloads on the lower part. The second advantage is that in that case, you don't need to use Java at all. Uh, we offer a client uh, API for uh, C and C++, for C Sharp, for Python, for Go, and for Node.js. So on one side, you are stuck to Java. On the other side, you can use a lot of different stacks. And this is the schema that I showed you from the ETL, but applied to Jets. 
So we offer a couple of connectors like input connectors and output connectors, like we call them like sources and sinks. And in all cases, if you don't have something that uh, fits your needs, you, we have an API and you can write your own. And then, as I mentioned, you can do everything that an ETL does, um, but like distributed all over the network by essence. I told you about the enrichment, the fact that um, sometimes your events uh, probably has just references an ID and you need to fetch the data. Imagine that if you do that inside a traditional database ETL stuff, that means that every time you would need to do a query to the database, which is not super great. Uh, what Hazel Cars Jet allows you to do is uh, you would uh, prefetch the data, well, from a database or already from somewhere else and put that in memory in the cluster. And then when you need uh, to find the ID, it's just like saying, hey, give me the ID from a map. And that is very, very fast. And actually, that's what I will do in the demo. Now that we know how to process data, well, we, we need data. And <clears throat> I would like just to have a, a small uh, a section about open data. Like open data is to data what open source was to source because right now we have a lot of open source and free software. But when you want to have like data endpoints, it's really hard. So I believe this is a nice, nice initiative. And well, I'm from France. I work in Switzerland. So um, here are a couple of open data initiatives. In general, they are like pushed by the, the governments because the government wants to open its data because <clears throat> in general, administration has a lot of data that for ages was kept inside <laughs> its border and they want to give you as much data as possible. So to improve society in general, or at least to uh, make some business can earn some money. Um, if you are not from the European Union or uh, well, I've so seen some open data initiative in California, for example. So you need to check your, uh, where you live. Uh, well, it, it's, it's just the beginning of the journey, actually, because when you want to leverage uh, open data endpoints, uh, well, you, you face the following challenge. Uh, accessing them first, <laughs> what's the format? Uh, do they follow any standards and the correctness of the data? So let's talk a bit about them. Um, if you are a developer, and I tell you, hey, I have an open data something, you will think about a web service. Well, that's the problem is that most administrations, they don't, they are not IT organizations uh, and their IT department probably are just tasked uh, to handle a computer. So in general, most of the time you need to download a file, which is not super great. Um, because then you need to set up, uh, set, uh, up a job that will download the file at regular intervals, and then it's, it's not super great. The second is, well, you would expect that open data means open formats. And uh, yes, it can be the case, um, but uh, good luck if you ever had to scrap data out of a PDF. Um, but sometimes you just receive like Microsoft Excel files. And I'm not talking about the new Microsoft Excel file that is just a zip archive with several XML files. I'm, I'm talking about the old binary format that is completely proprietary. So second problem. Um, you might um, have heard about this comic where they, uh, they say, hey, there are like 14 competing standards. Uh, ah, that's a bad situation. I will create a, a new standard that binds them all. And soon there are 15 standards. Well, here it's the same situation. Like imagine we are already in a nice place. Um, we have like a web service, it written XML, and we expect XML to be following some kind of grammar, not just being anything. Uh, that's the problem. Most of uh, what you receive, they follow no, no real grammar. If it's JSON, of course, there is no grammar. Uh, but XML, I, I would expect something, but uh, no. So we would like to have some standards, but no. And finally, fun, fun thing. Um, that is actually part of my demo. Um, this is one of the data file I receive. And the second and third columns, they are actually times. 
So I, I know what that 4.20 is. I know which time it is. Um, I have a hard time knowing what 25 hour is. I mean, what does it mean? Uh, shall I uh, remove uh, 24 hours or shall I say it's uh, like one o'clock the day after? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. So perhaps I can skip this data altogether. You, you might know um, if you if you're a bit uh, an, a data scientist, you might have heard about this joke that uh, data scientists, they complain that they are spend, spending 80% of their time like curating data instead of analyzing it. Well, that's exactly the problem they, they, they are complaining about. Huh? The data you receive most of the time is not what you would expect. I'm nearly at the end before the demo. Um, so I have found a standard. I found something called the General Transit Fit Specification. Uh, I would expect it to be a public standard. No, it's provided by Google, but at least it's a format that is uh, that lets you uh, know about transportation schedule and with, of course, with the uh, latitude and longitude. So it's based on a bunch of static files, and I, I won't go through all of them, but basically what we need to remember is that first you have static model, like in general stuff that doesn't change that often, that includes stops, the stops of the bus, they don't change that often. You have a lot of them. And then you have the dynamic model and the dynamic model actually might be the location of a vehicle. So you, you this is the model uh, I, I get, uh, you, I receive a JSON in the, in the demo. And actually here, uh, the feed message here, is the biggest envelope. And then you just need to get to the feed entity and you have all the positions of the vehicle. And if you read the specification, you read that, you say, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Why do I need stream processing for? So I find the organization that gives me this data and it has an open data endpoint and like miracle, it's actually a web service. Of course, there is, there is a constraint. I cannot call it uh, more than once per 30 seconds because they are afraid that they will be uh, like, uh, they will receive too many requests, but it's still good. They give you the GTFS static files that you need to download beforehand. And they give you this rest endpoint. And I say, okay, let's do it. That's easy. And then this is the model that I receive. And, and, <laughs> Where is the position? Where is the position? Well, I mean, the position means that you know exactly uh, the latitude and the longitude of the vehicle. Probably it's, it means you have a GPS chip that always sends the data and it's not the case here. So what they tell you is you have this kind of called trip update and here you have this stop time update. And what they tell you is how late they will be reaching the stop number X in the sequence. So you have a trip of uh, one, two, three, four, up to 10. And then you have the expected uh, time with the static file. And then they tell you, hey, at, uh, on the third stop, I will be late by uh, two minutes. And it's up to you to compute uh, the time they will be there. And now, there might be some interest in stream processing. So this is um, the data pipeline. I read from the web service. Second uh, step is I will split this like new JSON into multiple ports because I need to uh, like process every update separately. Then, as I mentioned, I will enrich Hi, it. Nicolas, I'm so sorry to interrupt you and cut you there. I, we want to see the end of the of the demo, of course, but we are running out of time. Do you think you could just wrap it up quickly? I'm sorry. So I will show you the uh, architecture diagram and I will, won't show you the demo. You will need to find it on the internet. This is, uh, you can't do that to us. <laughs> I will show you a movie because, okay. Let me get back to my architectural diagram so you understand the concept. Yep. And so here, uh, is, is it streamed? Yes. Um, so here I have uh, this initial loader job that will uh, send, as I mentioned, the job. The job will re read the data files 
and put them into IMDG for latex consumption. Then I have this dynamic data loader that will send this new job and this new job will read data from the rest endpoint and enrich it from the data that was read from the data file. And finally, on the last component is to register a, a, an application that will register to changes and then it will be warned about those changes and it will update the, the position of the, um, of the public transport, of each public transportation on the map. So no demo, just a little movie because, sorry about the time, I prepared it because I knew it, there could be an issue. So this is what it looks like. And you can yeah, zoom and you will see here are the routes and you can see the stops because they are from the static data file and you can see the little transportation moving between those two points. Of course, I don't know the exact position. I'm just doing interpolation because, because I know the time it was at the previous stop and I know the time it will reach this stop. So let me wrap, wrap this up. So streaming has a lot of benefits compared to batching. Um, and it's even better if we can leverage open data, but be careful because it's the wild west. There are no standards and the real world data is not really great, but you can like achieve really, really, really cool stuff. So a couple of references, my blog, my Twitter, uh, Jet, the Jet website, the repository, if you want to play by, uh, like, uh, by yourself, uh, everything is on GitHub. And if you're interested in knowing more about Hazelcast and Hazelcast Jet, join our Slack channel. I'm really sorry to be late. Uh, in general, I try to be like faster, but um, today I don't know why. I, I was feeling chatty probably. <laughs> yeah, and you're Swiss. I mean, come on, what's, what's going on here? I mean... I'm not Swiss. I'm not oh, Swiss. That, I'm that, French. You just live there. Oh, you're French. Okay, that's that's it. That explains it. You see. No, you're just a couple of minutes over. No problem. Thank you so much for that talk. I thought it was really well structured and great to follow. Yes. So thank you so much for that. Unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions, which is annoying because I have a few of my own. I'd like to ask you. Uh, but first of all, for people that want to see this demo, where do they have to go? Just leave that so it's nice and clear. Um, they will go on the Hazelcast jet train and if you, I will provide you with the slides on, on the slides. So on the last slide, it's, it's it will be there. Here. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, and I have one very specific question. I'll just fire it at you. It says here, I do not understand why, why you place Google PubSub as a processing engine. Maybe you confused it with GCP data flow. No, no, I, I'm just, uh, okay, it, it was just like to send data and to uh, get data, sorry. Okay, well, that, that clarifies that. So, uh, Nicholas, thank you so much. And sorry to rush the ending here, but we are running out of time. So, once again, thank you very much for this talk. If you have any more questions, join our Slack, reach me on Twitter, my DMs are open, and uh, thanks for your invites, and uh, yeah, see you. And good luck to the next speaker, who happens to be a friend, Philippe Krenn. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Nicolas. Bye. So we'll be taking a short break now. Before, that, before we do that, I just want to remind you to go and take a look at the uh, sponsors exhibitor section. Go and show your support for them. If it weren't for them, none of this would be possible. So go and do that. And we'll be back in a few minutes.